This is the Clean Energy Show with Brian Stockton and James Whittingham. Hello and welcome to episode 38 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. And I'm James Whittingham. Welcome to an entertaining discussion of the week's developments in clean energy and transportation. This week, boy, Brian, I thought we were going to have a slow week. And you're getting back to me telling me you got stories up the yang here. It's crazy. Yeah, it's never a slow week, and it's even a holiday today, but that doesn't seem to stop the news. Yes, it's a Remembrance Day holiday in Canada, where we are, and uh, I've got lots of stories. I want to talk about a new report from ThinkX. My guru, Tony Siba, and his crew have released. It's very interesting, and it it reaffirms a radical notion that I, James Whittingham, had about a couple years ago, and people said, James, you're crazy. James, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, the experts are backing me up, Brian, and possibly listening to our podcast. <laughs> well, just for the record, I want to say, James, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. Okay, there. It's on the record. Uh, it is logged in the podcast for eternity now, and uh, there won't be any clerical errors uh, overlooking that. I also want to talk about Starlink coming to Canada. Starlink, Elon Musk's satellite service for rural internet because it's interesting this week because the canadian government is spending billions of dollars because we're a vast country brian we're a vast vast country we're not all in one place people are spread out those people who are off in the boonies off in the little rocks uh, in the icebergs they don't have internet and they deserve internet especially now in the time of covid and we're seeing a sort of a you know, a, a, a delineation between the uh, the haves and the haves nots when it comes to remote education, and a new company is getting into the fake meat game, and that company is the same company that makes Big Macs, the same company that has made me obese. That company is McDonald's, the one with the clown. That we'll be talking about them. What do you have this week? Well, there's a few new electric vehicles on the horizon, or updates to existing uh, electric vehicles, that kind of thing. Um, some more reports about uh, renewable energy versus coal, that kind of thing. Uh, the cost of electric vehicles, uh, lots of stuff. Yes. Well, let's get started, Brian. Um, I'm really happy. Uh, at least I was happy on Saturday because of the election. Do you remember that day? Was that a good day for you? Was it was for me? Yeah. It's uh, things have finally resolved. I know on last week's show we were, had live election results. Uh, but, as they came uh, in, Brian. As they came in. Yeah, it's uh, it's basically all over, barring some uh, ridiculous, uh, unforeseen uh, circumstances. But um, yeah, it's uh, you know, so we're on track for maybe the U.S. getting back into the Paris Accord. Uh, lots of good news for the environment. Uh, Personal question: What was yeah. your reaction? Did you did you feel something? Did you feel anything? Yeah, I felt relief. I felt uh, happiness, but it had been kind of coming for a few days because it you know if you sort of dug deep on twitter it was fairly clear that it was going to be called in that direction a few days earlier so you know it, it wasn't the big aha kind of moment it would you know because it just had been delayed for a few days but uh yeah it was it was uh relief well i uh i it crossed my mind for months what would i do if on election night as they when they called obama's name if they uh, declared it then what would i do would i would i would i get in my car and drive up and down the streets yelling and screaming i think i would have i think i yeah. would have because when it happened on saturday i was making my breakfast minding my own business and there it came and uh i just i had all every emotion all at once i was like crying laughing screaming i, I found myself angry i was yelling at the tv for <laughs> what's his name to go far away where it's hot and just get away you know and i just yeah, and there I was a whole bunch a of things inside me, Ryan. To, a whole uh, bunch of things. They all came out. I want to give a shout out to all our thousands of listeners in North Dakota. We're just above North Dakota <laughs> here in Canada, and um, I have a huge fondness for North Dakota. You and I have been to the Fargo Film Festival at the magnificent Fargo Theater, uh, but they're really struggling in North Dakota right now. The COVID cases are crazy out of control. Um, it's so bad there that uh, they had somebody elected. Uh, to the Senate, who died from COVID. That's how bad it is there, and uh, it was too he late. He died to get and him still got elected, and he won anyway. So you know, they they talk about dead men voting. What about dead men getting elected? I assume he was a Republican. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, he was, and it's not funny. I shouldn't be laughing, and and uh, no. but I, I really feel for uh, everybody in North Dakota. It's, uh, I mean, the numbers here in Saskatchewan are not great either. They're trending in that direction, but nothing like uh, North Dakota, which has the highest per capita right now in the U.S. By the way, Fargo, great city, fantastic city, fantastic people. Uh, the rest of the place, uh, they must feel like they're in the minority and uh, roll their eyes and. Uh, and when we were down there for the uh, film festival, it was the February before the election, and uh, Trump wasn't officially the guy. But I was actively searching for a Trump sign. I, w- I wanted to bring one back, <laughs> even then. I didn't think he'd win, but uh, <laughs> I was actively searching for a Trump sign. Didn't find one. Uh, I was going to offer someone money for it if I found it. But uh, Just while we're on pandemic news, there was an announcement. It sounds, uh, if you're an optimist like me, that uh, we should have a vaccine supply here in Canada oh, yeah. within the first three months of 2021. And I'm going to be f- first in line after the uh, nurses and doctors and first responders and people with severe underlying conditions who are, you know, recovering from cancer or in treatment or something like that. Then comes the fat guys, okay? Then comes the fat guys. We're next in line. Screw you, skinny fuckers. You, you, pe- so I have to bleep that out now because we're going to in India. So now I have to bleep. I have to edit now because I got mad. <laughs> Way to go, James. Damn it. Anyway, I want it first. You professors who, who, who are healthy, you don't need it. You, know, you don't need anything. So wash your hands. I'll just stay in my bomb shelter. <laughs> okay, stay in your bomb shelter. Yeah, you got a bomb shelter. I don't know if it's uh, going to protect you from the COVID, but uh, anyway. All right, Brian, I wanted to talk about thinkx.org, Tony Siba's website, because they, uh, not website, organization, uh, they are planning um, and studying uh, future disruptions in technology and, and other things. And uh, okay, the the basic concept, and I read it, and it's very it's very dry and technical. So even me, I got lost in it a bit, even though I'm nerdy and I have nothing to do during the pandemic. But uh, their basic uh, study was they studied three states. One was in the northeast of the United States. They're all in the United States. One was in California, and one was Texas. And what would it take? to go to 100% wind, battery, and uh, solar. Now, Tony has often said the whole world is going to be solar because it's so cheap. Well, it's uh, it's not, though. He's actually have two times the amount for wind for some reason, which I found interesting. Often, uh, they when they really got down to um, you know doing the, the research and studying it, they thought, well, maybe uh, two times the wind from the solar. And it has nothing to do with price because solar is, in contrast to what you said last week or the week before, I think it was the week before, solar continues to go down. And you say, James, you said to me, well, it's only like 0.9 cents or 1.5 cents. But if you're spending a billion dollars on something huge and it's half that money, then it makes a difference if it's 0.5 cents or 0.9 cents. It makes it, you know, it's twice as much. So it's still going down at a tremendous rate. And uh, here's what they their big idea is. And this is the idea that I had that I pitched to the, some of the solar guys in where we live. And they just looked at me like I was an idiot. Like I was an idiot. And by, by you know, I'm not. We, we we're on the record saying I'm crazy. But it is... Here's what they said. They said to overbuild. I thought, what would we do in Saskatchewan? Well, if solar was really cheap in the future, in the near future, so cheap, why not overbuild it? Because in in our winters, we have very short days uh, in December. And right now, I have zero solar on my roof because we just had a big snowfall. I'm hoping it'll melt. It'll melt on Friday, hopefully. And I'll get back to normal, depending on how things go. But... That doesn't affect it too much. I think a a grid scale solar farm, um, they would either clear the panels or they would uh, erect them in such a way that the snow would just fall off for the most part. Uh, Mine are a little bit more flat. Yours are very flat, which uh, causes the snow to accumulate. Anyway, we have short winters here, and why not just angle the panel? Here's If you're watching YouTube, I'm going to show you what our ideal panel angle is. It's something like that. It's only about 40 degrees. But in the wintertime, on the winter solstice, it's almost, <laughs> almost, almost vertical, okay? Because we, 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 you can actually look this stuff up where you live. It's almost vertical. And um, so I thought, well, why not just build up for, you know, the worst case scenario on December 18th, overbuild it, and uh, you don't need to use all the electricity. But what they're saying is overbuild it. 
And what they have is a sort of a graph. They've studied the graphs. Where is the sweet spot? Because batteries are still expensive and they will still, you know, be a large expense of the mix even in 10, 15 years from now. They'll be a lot cheaper than they are today because they continue to fall. But they said there's a sweet spot and they, they had a little U-shaped graph. So where is the sweet spot? Uh, or how much batteries, where it's better to overbuild the wind and solar and have less batteries. So there's an economic sweet spot for that, which I found very interesting. They studied that. So they call it super, I, I believe they call it superpower, and this is their concept of having, uh, basically they said some days we'll have twice the energy of an average use of, say, year-round, your average use year-round, whatever it is. Some days mm -hmm. this system would have twice the energy needed. So that's to meet 100% clean energy. But what do you do with that? Here's what you do with it. You make, you use it for things such as uh, powering cars. Maybe you power cars for free. Maybe you power buses for free. Maybe you power school buses for free. Maybe you make uh, water from salt water from a, a desalination project, which uses lots of uh, energy. That's been talked about uh, when solar becomes really cheap, making water uh, from the ocean. And because uh, there is a lot of water in the ocean, last time I checked. And it's, it's not, I heard that, yeah. not a terrible thing to use a lot of it as it, as it is in lakes. Uh, and of course, there's other things like making hydrogen, uh, just make the hydrogen when you have the extra power, but you have the extra power most of the time. And just when those times when you don't, when it's been cloudy or calm or just a long period of time, then you just say, you know, I guess those workers get laid off or they don't work all the time. I don't know how that works, but this is the concept. And they, they did an extensive job proving it out. And now I await your thoughts. Well, yeah, I think the tricky part is what you just alluded to there. You know, how do you run a business of, say, making hydrogen when you might run the business Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then have to lay everybody off for five days and then bring them back? That's the only, you know, it's a sort of a grid issue, like you're talking about overbuilding the grid, but all of these separate projects could be separate businesses. So it's a matter of how you coordinate all those things. Well, you you could. I mean, when the energy is free, though, because you remember they're they're it's next to free free or next to free is what they're talking about with a system like this. So there that opens up a lot of possibilities. If you're working for free, you could just have the people sit around in the lunchroom for three days. I don't know, <laughs> or have a paid day off to do community labor. Or do you say say you're the grid? You say okay, we've overbuilt. We have this extra power. Somebody want to build a hydrogen plant, we'll give you free power, and that's their incentive to build a sure, plant. Would you do that? The, but then how do you decide who gets the contract? I don't think that is a big problem. I don't think Tony does either. I think these guys are, are just looking at the concept and that uh, the other parts get worked out. So I think, I, I think that's very interesting. And I think it's, regardless of what you think about this, I think it's inevitable that when things get cheap enough in the next few years and beyond that uh, it's going to become... Uh, there's going to be an oversupply of it. And there already is in California. Uh, California had an oversupply of it. They didn't know what to do with it. Uh, it's, and and they, they did all this, this analysis based on having zero hydro. We even have hydro in Saskatchewan here, even though we use a lot, half of it as coal that we use right now, or 45% or something. No nuclear um, and no interconnection between regions. This is what they did the, the study on. So you add those things into the mix and it becomes suddenly cheaper because you have some hydro, some base load. Maybe you have some nuclear. Maybe you can share one place has an, an access, then that access goes to the other. This is the, some of the things that were talked about when Hillary Clinton ran, was running against Barack Obama. She was proposing stuff like I was looking at the green energy plans and in 2007 and 2008, and they were talking about, well, we have to upgrade the grid. We have to upgrade the grid for a smart grid to go between regions. Hasn't happened. Not so much. Yeah. Well, there's a, a bunch of car news. Maybe I'll go over some of it quickly here. Um, Tesla has confirmed a new 82 kilowatt hour battery pack in the Model 3. So previously, I believe the hot biggest pack was 75. And this is just from that energy density increase that we were, I think, talking about last week, where Panasonic makes the cells. These are the older 2170 cells. And just by tweaking the chemistry, they've sort of increased the energy density by about 5%. So this is now the confirmation in that. It's basically the same battery pack that they used to make before, but with the tweaked 
cells, it's 5% more uh, energy density, so it's an 82 instead of a 75, and this is now official. So these are baby steps, but they're not insignificant. Yep. They're not insignificant. If you, One thing that I learned when I had my solar system installed in my house, my rooftop solar, uh, I couldn't do it at first, and I had to wait a year before we could get the financing done. And in that year, my um, inverter, the big box in my one of my rooms of the house that converts the solar uh, from DC power into AC power that can go into the grid and into your walls and everything and use, that became something like 3% more efficient. So mm -hmm. it, it was like 98% uh, efficient instead of 95 in that one year. And it was the same price. Okay, that's mm -hmm. the same thing. But for 30 years, I'll have 3% more electricity in my house for free. That's a big deal. Yeah. And that is a huge <laughs> deal. And uh, it's even bigger deal when, when technology like this at the grid scale, uh, which is, you know, 10,000 times the size of my house or whatever, is uh, you know, little, little baby steps make a big deal in this world that we're talking about. So, um, and it's, the price has not gone up, right? It's the same price? Same price. If anything, it's probably dropped a little bit from when the car first came out. So, yeah, just a, a 5% increase. Yeah, it, for a car that's only been out for three years, that, that's amazing. It is amazing, and it's going to continue to happen. And maybe some of those increments will be a little bit bigger than others, but it's a march that is steadily going on. And so many people, uh, when, they, when they complain about electric cars or they complain about solar or wind or whatever the things that we talk about on this show, they never look at the trajectory of things. The trajectory of things is unstoppable, and it's continuing uh, into the future. And by the way, I just wanted to go back to the, the ThinkX things for a second. Uh, they do call it superpower, and uh, it is about building uh, more than you need, build maybe twice as much as average to cover the rare occurrences, which I found interesting. And the sweet spot was, uh, you know, between solar and overbuilding, and... Uh, the, the two to one wind over solar mix. I would love to have Tony on the show to ask him about that because I found that very interesting. But um, <laughs> solar does have a continuing cost curve. Uh, onshore wind is forecast to be 40% cheaper uh, by 2030. And all, all this report was based on 2030. And solar is looking to be 80% cheaper by 2030. 80% Brian Stockton who said solar is irrelevant about the solar going down. 80% less. That's crazy. And it was just, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think one of the things I was thinking of is in terms of residential solar, we won't see an 80% decrease no. because when you're putting it on your house, the main cost is like the, the labor for the installation and everything. So for solar on your roof in by 2030, it won't drop by 80%. But these large scale things? Absolutely. You know, a large chunk of that that goes on your roof, the, it's like a third or um, um, 40, 50%. I don't know the, the cost of a home solar will go down 80% perhaps. Um, but you know what they did in Australia that was a big um, money saver? Why 25% of Australians have solar on their houses? It's they, um, they got rid of the red tape because, you know, yeah. when you and I got solar, we had to wait for weeks and, you know, they had to get a permit. We had to buy a special meter and SAS Power had to have a building permit and things. They got rid of most of that and streamlined it. And if you can do that, and Tesla uh, Solar is always pushing for this, they want um, that to be decreased because that's one of the biggest savings you can do. Because if you can, uh, um, you know, and it, it clogs things up, you need more office staff and things like that. Uh, and it, it just greatly reduces the cost of rooftop solar. So that's one thing that I'm looking for. But what else do you have? Uh, so other car news, BMW has revealed the iNext electric SUV. This is a 300 miles of range uh, SUV. Um, it's a electric car from the ground up. It's uh, supposed to be coming out by the end of 2021. Um, I don't know if that's going to be coming to Canada by then. This is probably, I would guess, Europe first. But, um, yeah, net yet another uh, major uh, electric car announcement. Are you excited about it? Well, yeah, it um, seems like a good car, and the more players, uh, the better. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know how I feel about luxury SUVs. I, I, I want a Corolla for $30,000. That's what I want. I want a, a car that the masses can buy and, and save money on. 
Yeah, well, I want to talk about the cost of EVs in a second here, but um, Hyundai also revealed a refresh for the Kona Electric. So uh, this is a car that I almost bought. It's a really excellent small SUV, and uh, it's only been out a couple of years, but they've already um, announced this refresh with kind of slightly uh, different looks, and uh, I, I think the, the powertrain's probably about the same, but... Um, They've sold a lot of these cars. I'm just looking for the, I think it was 120,000 that they've sold now around the world um, of the Hyundai Kona. Probably could have so sold a half a million if they wanted to, but they don't want to. If they had made a half a million, they could have sold a half a million. But, uh, you know, this is a uh, this is a serious car. Yeah, 120,000 units so far of the Kona out there, which is that's not bad. It's not bad. I am impressed that it only took them two years to refresh. Because if you look at the... Um, a lot of cars, like the say the uh, Chevrolet Bolt, it's suddenly like yeah. old news now, and no one wants one. The people were very excited about it. You couldn't get your hands on one for months and months and months, and now people are like, eh, you know, it's yeah. not exciting. It's not a great looking car. It could be improved, I think, with some tweaks. And uh, so the fact that Hyundai d took only two years to do it impresses me, because uh, if they keep doing that. Um, they're not exactly over the air updates like Tesla does where your whole car changes, but, uh, yeah. it's a step in the right direction. I'd like to see everyone go to over the air updates. Yeah. Now just continuing on with the cost of electric vehicles, which we, um, alluded to earlier and, and do all the time. Uh, the Toronto star had an excellent article this week where they, uh, crunched the numbers and found that electric cars are already cheaper over a 10 year lifespan. So, um, they looked at a couple of different things here, like they compared the Nissan Qashqai, which is a gas-powered SUV, uh, to the Kia Nero EV and found that over 10 years, the Kia is more uh, is less expensive, even though it costs a bit more up front. And then they compared a uh, Mercedes-Benz C-Class to a Tesla Model 3, again, a kind of a similar car, uh, but over 10 years, um, the, the Tesla is already cheaper. It's not a huge amount cheaper, uh, but... People, of course, are always worried about the cost of the car and the, the electric cars will keep coming down. But here is proof. If you're going to keep it for 10 years, uh, the electric car is already cheaper. That's amazing. And it's important news because uh, we don't often feel like we have affordable electric cars where we live. Uh, in the States, yeah. they have a more generous federal program that's run out for Tesla. So that would be including the, um, the $5,000 uh, federal discount that we get in Canada. Is that right? Yeah, I believe it does. Oh, yeah. does it include like provincial incentives that we don't get where we live? Well, no, probably not because those are not uh, universal. But um, it, it's an article from the Toronto Star. I'd recommend everybody go uh, uh, have a look for that. That's a, car news is over. We should have the EV of the week. I think that would be an excellent segment to have, you know, because there's so many coming out. People are losing track of them all. But um I don't know. Do you feel jealous about the Model 3 every time they improve it and you're stuck with your old jalopy from six months ago? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're keep, yeah, hearing about these improvements. Well, the one thing that has not been confirmed yet is the heated steering wheel. So I'm kind of hoping it doesn't uh, have a heated steering wheel because that is one thing I would kind of like. Uh, but it's so far, that's not been confirmed whether it has it or not. That reminds me, I turned on my heated steering wheel in my Leaf yesterday. And by the way, I went to pick up a pizza. Yeah, pizza. <laughs> I hadn't been out in weeks. I hadn't been out. I don't know how to drive anymore. My my son <laughs> in high school has been driving around in the electric car um, happily and uh, pretty much has it all to himself, although his guy, high school has shut down because of numerous cases. They didn't say how many. They said numerous, which Yikes. is uh, encouraging. Um, so, yeah, he was actually quarantined uh, for a couple of long days because he sat next to a guy who got sick in his school and then was waiting his wow. COVID test. So he did not like that. Although he's always in his room anyway. The funny thing is he's always in his room anyway, but because he was forced <laughs> to be in his room, he did it. And it was his own decision. He spent the entire next day with us on election day. Yeah. It was actually about a half hour after the election was called the entire day, never left, which is incredibly yeah. unusual. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, Brian, uh, burger chain McDonald's said it would debut its own plant-based meat alternatives called the McPlant, which is very inventive McDonald's. You're still putting a Mick in front of pretty much everything in 2021. Ending speculation over the, uh, the world's restaurant chain would be partnered with. Well, they apparently mislabeled their news release. I didn't imply that McDonald's was building their own 
plant-based meats, which I thought was a good idea, because if you're that big of a company and everything you sell is eventually going to be plant-based, believe yeah. me, mark my words, then why not make it yourself? Well, that was a, apparently a misprint, and uh, <laughs> Beyond Meat stock, which they used in a test in Ontario and here in Canada for a little while last year, and apparently it went well because they're going all in on it, uh, their stock went down as much as 30%. So it's just yeah, because people thought they were because not of a misworded press release. Yeah, well, it might even been <laughs> punctuation or something. Um, so, but that's it's 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 bounced back up in in uh, in the meantime. So uh, they have co-created a plant-based patty together, uh, which will soon compromise a new category of food offerings at the number one fast food company in the United States. The McPlant platform will start with a meat-free burger. In several markets next year, having completed test runs in Canada, as I mentioned, the McDonald's announcement of his new meatless menu line didn't mention that Beyond Meat was in um, was its plant-based burger supplier. But that was just an oopsie, and uh, they are, in fact, doing it. I am looking forward, because here's the deal, in case you're just joining us, the deal is that plant-based um, meats and other foods will take over starting around 2030, and at some point in the, later in this decade, uh, they're already at par at KFC where I live, but uh, they will be cheaper and they will be substantially cheaper and safer. Because, I mean, do you really trust a teenager to, to boil out the salmonella in your piece of chicken at KFC? Or would you rather something that can't have salmonella in it? And, <laughs> and uh, you know, stuff like that. And, and they, they do a lot of work making sure we don't get poisoned because... Uh, uh, you got to get that beef, the E. coli in the beef cooked out. I, my apologies to our listeners in India who are not understanding our talk about beef. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, McDonald's can take over India because it'll have uh, a completely vegetarian menu. And we should probably go invest in McDonald's, although it wouldn't feel good sleeping at night with investing in McDonald's. But <laughs> just a thought yeah. for you investors out there. Yeah. What do you think? Well, maybe just go with the Beyond Meat stock. We should have bought it when it dropped, dropped there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I wish I had money to invest because we can. Foresee, people should be listening to our show for investment advice, and we should have disclaimers. Well, you know, I always wonder about that because you listen to podcasts or watch YouTube channels, and they always make these qualifications. This is not an investment advice, you know. I, why do they do that? Are they afraid of getting sued? We should just say this is investment advice. All right. This is what we're giving you investment advice. <laughs> it's up to you to decide whether we're the crazy or not. Brian's already uh, proclaimed me crazy. So, I mean, you want to go ahead on my information based on his uh, psychological assessment? You go right ahead. There. That's my disclaimer. Well, uh, Tesla is adding to their giant battery pack in Australia. This was at one time the largest one in the world, and they're uh, now making it even bigger. Um, so that's always fun. Um, oh, yeah, there was another coal, uh, car story I, I forgot to mention. Uh, Polestar uh, has had a bit of a recall with their Polestar 2 uh, electric cars. So uh, I just bring it up because it, we had a few weeks there where it seemed like there was lots of uh, recall notices and stuff. So um, another one for Polestar. Well, that did, it wasn't out very long. I mean, did they even sell any cars before they had the recall? No, they, remind they us, barely sold any. But Remind us who makes Polestar. It's a problem with the inverter. Oh, that's never good. Remind us about who makes, because it's expensive and it could start a fire. Yeah, Polestar, smoke. this is a sort of a Model 3 competitor, kind of on the, the higher end uh, subsidiary of uh, Volvo. Okay, coming up soon, it's the lightning round. <laughs> where I'll be feeding headlines to Brian, and he'll be responding one after the other uh, with his analysis. Brian, what else do you have this week? Well, there was a report from, oh yeah, renewables, Renewable Energy Defies COVID-19 Hit for record growth in 2020. So the International Energy Agency expects green electricity to end coal's 50-year reign by 2025. Now, if you're just joining us, 2025 is in about four years. Four years from now. That's, uh, uh, that'll go by pretty fast if I don't die from the COVID. I mean, that's, uh, that's right now. Well, it'll probably go by even faster if you die from the COVID. That's right, it will. Time goes by very fast when you're dead. Um, very fast. <laughs> 
I, I you know, depending on the market, coal is not doable right now. So why do governments where we live say coal should be okay is just as long as we clean it up and spend billions of dollars, a billion and a half dollars, um, cleaning it up to, to, to take the carbon out of it and then store it somewhere and hope that it doesn't go back in the atmosphere. Yeah, well, you don't have to convince me, but uh, maybe this podcast will convince somebody else. <laughs> Especially investors. That's a large thing of what's actually going on is there's this stampede uh, of um, divestment. Uh, de what, what's the word I'm, I'm, that's slipping me? Yeah, divestments, I guess. Money leaving the fossil fuel sector. Yeah, it's like uh, there, apparently, though, there's a lot of uh, pension funds still in fossil fuels, which is, uh, it's not about ethics, it's about them going broke, those poor old people. Yeah, well, and I was listening to an investment uh, channel on YouTube, and apparently one of the reasons people are still holding their Exxon stock, which has, you know, really tumbled in the last few years, um, they're still paying dividends. Some stocks will pay you dividends, and so um, even though the, the company is uh, almost worthless compared to a few years ago, they're still paying out dividends at the same kind of rate, so people are holding on to the stock because of that, because everyone likes a dividend. Uh, but it's... It's a, a house of cards that they're trying to prop up by continuing to pay dividends when they probably shouldn't be. Brian, I wanted to talk about Starlink, Elon Musk's um, SpaceX Starlight satellite deal, where you have $500 to buy a little box and a little satellite dish to track satellites in low orbit. And uh, you and I both signed up to be a beta tester, although we talked about last week that we probably wouldn't do that because it's 500 bucks to buy the equipment. And you're not really out at the cottage where you would most benefit from it. Um, but it has been, uh, they're talking about sending these boxes out to Canada now. So the people who are signing up you might be getting emails soon about having the opportunity to sign up in Canada. The lower part of Canada and the most northern part of the United States is where they're doing it. Um, now, Something happened in, in Canada last week where we had our federal government, as I was talking about earlier, we have a very sparse population outside of a whole bunch of major centers. There is a lot of population that, you know, it would be hundreds of kilometers to run a high-speed cable to, and in the north you'd have to go over rock, and it would be, it's hard and expensive to give high-speed internet to everybody. Um, now, most of the population is in urban centers, but... I don't know what the breakdown is anymore, but some of it is not. And those people need to have high-speed internet. So the government is pouring $1.8 billion. Um, some of it was announced before, and a little bit more was announced this week to um, to buy, um, well, to, to, to help people get fiber optics out to, to small places so they can have high-speed internet, broadband, as we call it here in North America. And... Uh, Basically, they've signed a deal with another um, satellite company uh, that is in competition with uh, Tesla, Tesla, SpaceX, Starlink. It is another one. They they put their money on another satellite. I can't remember the name of it right now, but um, I don't have it in front of me. But they're putting billions into this, and uh, this other low orbit satellite company is behind, significantly behind where te where te where SpaceX is. So uh, I'm a little bit disappointed in that because they're not all going with the satellite service. But I wondered to myself, I says to myself, James, what would one point eight billion dollars buy you if you just gave everybody Starlink hardware for five hundred dollars each? The answer, Brian, according to um, you know who, Alexa. Hello, Alexa. There are no timers set. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're really not making a good name for yourself, you know, with uh, Black Friday sales coming up and you going on sale. No one's going to buy you after they listen to you on the show being an idiot. You're, you're just stupid. Okay. $1.8 billion, Brian, you ask. 3.6 million Starlink satellite boxes. And that's about 10% of Canada's population. And I would guess that 10 per it's, it's less than 10% of Canada's population that has uh, poor access to uh, broadband internet. It's probably 8% or less. So you could take that money and just every, you know pay half of the boxes maybe or something. Or maybe um, 
you know, ca actual cable TV boxes are like 250 or $200, or at least they used to be. So you would just rent them. It would be part of your monthly bill. Why not do that with Tesla and just rent the box? Because, I mean, if you buy a, a normal satellite TV um, cable package, television package, you still have to buy the hardware and set it up. So I, I'm wondering, like, it's a lot easier to just give everybody a box or to supplement it or, you know, um, subsidize it in some way than it is to run a high-speed internet uh, land over tundra to some remote Inuit village in the far north. You know, just give them um, this, I don't know, does, this, does the low-orbit satellites work for that far north? I mean, eventually it will, won't it? I mean, it's not like this is their prime deal, but they, they spin around the earth constantly. Yeah, eventually that's their plan. I think maybe there's maybe at the very north and south pole it wouldn't or something like that. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the stuff like the wheels were probably put in motion for this government program a long time ago. And, um, you know, the Starlink thing wasn't quite real back then. So, uh, yeah, it looks like a, maybe an unfortunate uh, spend of the money. All right, it's time for the lightning round. The Clean Energy Show lightning round. Oh, it's a very popular segment, Brian, and I know that you work hard on it all week getting ready. However, I don't have a whole lot of lightning round stories here for you this week, so I'm going to uh, go through it quickly. Flow Chargers, the charging home charging company, Flow, has uh, a new charger for truck fleets that is almost as fast as low-end DC fast chargers at 30% of the cost. So... A low-end DC fast charger, that is the kind that you use at a gas station or a commercial place and pay money for, not in your home, is starts around 25 kilowatts, 25,000 watts. These, which you can have at your fleet, your say you work for a small company, you've got 10 trucks that are electric, they would charge at 19 kilowatts and only cost 30% as much. Uh, I'm not sure that fleets need 19 kilowatts. Um but some will, and they're offering this charger. Your thoughts? Well, it seems uh, it seems a little too slow. Why bother? Like uh, it's cheaper, so that's why you would do it. But why bother with something that's so slow? Well, it's not commercial. You're at the shop here. Let's say you're the cable company, because I used to work at a cable company. You offer cable TV. You've got, say, twenty different trucks, and they're electric. But you would just charge them overnight at, say, 9 kilowatts or 12 kilowatts, and they would probably be charged up, especially for things that are used in the city. Uh, that's how I would do it. But if there's a truck, because trucks use more power, including um, semi-trucks, then I guess you would need more. I'm going to move on, Brian. You want to move on? I'll move on to the next one. Yeah. So new cells bo boost the Tesla Model 3 capacity to 82 kilowatts or 3% more. We've already discussed that. I'm going to move past it, but I just wanted to point out that it was a 3% gain. And every time you get a 3% gain, it's, it's, it's gravy in this space. And you eventually hit bench stone benchmarks, which, you know, suddenly you're flying planes. And by the way, there was a report today, I think in Scientific American, I, I didn't write it down. Darn it. I didn't have a chance. Maybe we'll talk about it next week that said aviation is the new frontier. And there's something like a uh, hundred different companies working on electric airplanes that carry passengers for money. Yeah, and I just wanted to mention too one thing we hadn't talked about in terms of robo taxis is the fact that um, something that's really set to be disrupted with robo taxis is short haul flights, which is a bit unfortunate because that's where electric airplanes are going to go first is short haul flights. Yeah. But think about like we live two and a half hours from Saskatoon. And people do sometimes take a flight, well, pre-COVID anyway. You know, you fly to Saskatoon, it's about a 45-minute flight, something like that. But when you add the time it takes to drive to the airport, you got to get there at least an hour for security and everything. So anything that's like two to three hours in terms of driving distance is going to get killed in terms of flights because it's going to be easier and cheaper to just take a robo-taxi to do that. On the ground or in the air? Uh, on the ground, it's it's like, um, you know, you can take a flight to Saskatoon, but it's going to take you about three hours. So it's not right. really saving you any time because of all the time going through security and everything. So, and it's probably going to cost at least $500. Whereas, you know, do it on 
uh, a, on the road with a robo taxi. It still takes you three hours probably, uh, but at way less cost, and you don't have to do the hassle of going through uh, airport security. So yeah, their their guess was that there's going to be airplanes that go uh, with 800 kilometer range, and um, part of that would be from would be hy- hybrid planes are possible too. So you use uh, the electricity to get you off the ground. And that's where a lot of it's used. And then you have you carry less fuel in the air and uh, make less pollution and, and stuff like that. But they said that these flights would go 800 kilometers and half the flights in the world are less than 800 kilometers. So if you look at that um, portion of air pollution, which is, oh, two, three, four percent, I think, of the world's air pollution come from aviation. And if you took that out, say, by 2050... Uh, a lot of that out, at least it, it, right now, it seems like it's possible to take half of that out, but maybe not all of it. So, Brian, the, the first Tesla Model 3 yellow cab hits the road in New York City, and boy, are people excited about that. What are your thoughts? Yeah, that's a big deal. Um, just seeing the picture of it in that yellow classic uh, New York. Uh, yeah, it's always kind of interesting to see which vehicles in New York end up as the uh, official yellow cab. So, uh that's fun. Makes a lot of sense. I would like to see the Model Y. I think the Model Y would be a perfect cab because it's uh, it's roomy and it's comfortable to get in and out of and, and easy for old people. So this is the lightning round. And we still have some more. The Honda E. That little E. That little Honda E isn't selling well, Brian. People said, oh, it's so cool. It's so cool. It's, they're going to sell like hotcakes. Um, causing Honda to have to buy credits from Tesla. Your thoughts? Well, it's cool, but the range is really poor, so I, I'm imagining it's not selling well. Is that what you're telling They're me? They're telling me it's not selling well. That's the latest information we have at the news desk here at the Clean Energy Show. Yeah, no, it's a really cool-looking car, and, uh, you know, I wouldn't mind one myself, but, uh, yeah, the range is it's just too small for 2020. So there's, they're probably thinking of it as a tiny little car that is for the city, the city only, and, uh, yeah... It's uh, it's not selling well, and apparently people want more range. And you know what? They're going to be able to put more range in that little sucker, as we get three, four, five percent increases in uh, in energy density and batteries. Things are going to improve, and maybe maybe it'll be okay. Maybe they just put a bigger battery in. Yeah, and it's a bit too small. Like I really like small cars, but that one's just a little bit too small. But it's cool. It's cool. Maybe for the- it's cool. Yeah. Biden confirms. <laughs> President-elect Joe Biden confirms the U.S. would rejoin the Paris Agreement on January 20th. Yeah, it sounds uh, like it's uh, all good news for the environment. That's uh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. if uh, the world doesn't... Uh, you know, doesn't it bother you that half of the U.S. population is so hungry to consume lies, to consume falsehoods that... Don't you think the world's falling apart? What What's going on? Do you have any answers, Brian Stockton? You're looking at me? For yes, answers? I'm looking at no, you. I don't, I don't have anyone else answers. to talk to. It's COVID. It's not like I do Skype calls with people. You're my only connection to the outside world, and you're in a bomb shelter. What do you have? What information do you have? It's, uh, you know, it's not good, but we're heading in the right direction. Oh, always the optimist on this show. All right, the last lightning round. <laughs> Ford invests $100 million in Kansas City factory to build the electric transit van. Your thoughts? Yeah, that's uh, transit vans are going to be a huge thing. Of course, Rivian's building one for Amazon. They're, they've got an order for 100,000 of them. This is one of those no-brainers that um, it's, it's all going to be switching very soon to electric. You know, we have all of these vans like that you know, burning gas, driving around our cities, uh, delivering all the millions of packages that we all get now. So um, it sounded like a bit of a, maybe that number is a bit small, that that um, they don't need a bigger investment than that, but it's good news. The Transit van is actually built on a car platform, whereas the Rivian is built on the Rivian small to mid-sized truck platform, which can carry heavier things because the vehicle is capable of towing 11,000 pounds, but most of the packages that come to my house are in a little uh, white van, little uh, minivan uh, from Amazon, from a private person uh, doing sort of the gig economy thing and and picking up packages and bringing them here. They're light. They're light. I ordered some jeans last week. 
One time last winter when we got a huge bunch of snow, um, there was a guy delivering packages in my neighborhood uh, on a sled, like he had presumably parked his... And you, with a thousand cameras in your house, did not take a picture. I'm so... Never been more disappointed than you. This is this is an yeah, outrage. I, I, you should have chased I him down. I drove past him, which is why I didn't have a camera with you him. You had a phone, damn it. Yeah, he had this... Pulling the sled with about 10 packages on it and just decided it was easier to go around uh, my neighborhood like that rather than uh, driving through the snow. <laughs> <laughs> on that note we like to hear from you with the clean energy show give us a call give us a a ringy ding ding uh find us on the twitter you have all that information before you and we'll see you again brian next week for another edition of the clean energy show yeah see you next week the clean energy show wants to hear from you contact us on twitter clean energy pod by email clean energy show at gmail.com by voicemail speakpipe.com slash clean energy show and don't forget to subscribe to our youtube channel